Welcome to the Sawtooth Software webinar series. I'm Megan Pites, the Ingenuity Ambassador at Sawtooth Software, and today's topic is A Consultant's Guide to Conjoint Analysis Reporting. I'm joined by Keith Shun, the head of Sawtooth Analytics, and we are going to cover different ways to show utilities, importances, and market simulations. All data outputs that you would get if you run a conjoint analysis experiment in Sawtooth Software. We'll also show you how to extend that data into other application areas so that you can, get ready for the buzz rays, curate your insights. So let's get started. So as I mentioned, we are going to cover utilities, importances, and simulations, and some really cool things you can do with those simulations. And then I'm going to pass it over to Keith, and he's going to cover some extensions of uh, conjoint analysis reporting. So to level set everybody, we are going to look at a choice-based conjoint exercise that asks respondents about different vacation packages. So in this example, you see we have three different concepts with a destination, a different number of nights, different types of accommodations and hotel types, etc. And people are asked to choose which they would prefer, and they do this eight times over. And some more detail about the exercise itself. Uh, we, so we have seven different destinations from the East Coast to the West. We have a different number of nights, three, five, and seven, different types of accommodations, so your star ratings, different hotel types, uh, whether a car rental is included in the fee or not, and a price per person. Uh, you can see there as well that low, medium, and high are kind of generic prices, and that is because price is going to be conditional upon the number of nights in this study. Uh, and something important about that we'll see when we get to the uh, results. So let's assume that we fielded our study and we got the right amount of completes for our design to be estimated efficiently. In Sawtooth software, when you run your analysis, you are going to get three different conjoint outputs. The primary one being our utilities. Whether you use logit estimation, latent class, or hierarchical Bayesian estimation will impact what those utilities actually look like. But from there, you take your utilities and you can turn those into important scores. And you can also turn those into a market simulator, which I think Keith and I both feel is the most important part of the output. But we'll start with the utilities. If we use the recommended hierarchical Bayesian estimation analysis, we can get the utilities at each individual level. So you can see an example here of the first 10 respondents and each utility, which is zero centered, for all of the levels within every attribute. So you can see the first seven rows are the seven different destinations. And if we put our cursor over the row, we would see that the sum of these utilities were equal to zero. And because we have individual level estimates, we can then take the average of each of those individual level estimates to get an overall utility for each of the different levels within each attribute. And that's the summary table that you're seeing below. So this is your typical output from Sawtooth Software, Lighthouse Studio. Uh, if you use hierarchical Bayesian regression, and a very similar, uh, at least for the summary, if you use logit and latent class. But now, what do you do with these utilities? How do you report them? How do you show them to your client? Well, a first very simple standard example, and one that we use in our current online simulator tool, is just bar charts. Uh, typically, we sort these from highest preference to lowest preference zero centered, so anything above zero means that it's higher than the average, anything below means that it's lower than the average. And then you can see that San Francisco is the most preferred to Orlando, to Las Vegas, to New York, to Anaheim, to Washington DC, to Chicago. Now, quick reminder for some of the newbies that might be on the webinar today, just because a utility is negative doesn't mean that it's bad, it just means that it's less preferred. The example I always like to give is, is if I offered you a million dollars, you'd be pretty happy. If I offered you five million dollars, you'd also be pretty happy. But if I zero center those scores, that one million is going to have a negative utility and the five million is going to have a positive utility just because they're zero centered. 
that doesn't mean you don't like a million dollars, right? So that's something that you definitely have to talk some of your clients through as you're going through conjoint analysis results and make sure that they understand how to properly interpret them. Um, but here's a simple vertical bar chart for our destination attribute. Uh, the next chart example we have are what's called tornado charts. And it's essentially just that vertical bar chart, but flipped on its side. I tend to prefer this approach uh, because it doesn't seem as obvious that things are positive and negative. Yes, they're to the left and the right, but we're used to interpreting things vertically um, as you know, positive and negative versus horizontal. I like to think of it as, you know, here's the base case versus, you know, boutique is preferred to resort and then to business. Um, so here's just a, another way of showing an attribute. Next, we can get even more specific with our utilities by showing the tornado charts with confidence bands. So with the Sawtooth software output, you will get the utilities and if you request them a 95% confidence interval band or 90% or, or whatever you're looking for. In this example, we're using 95% confidence bands. So if your client is interested in knowing amongst the car rental levels, full size, compact, and none, are there significant differences, you can say, okay, people prefer the full size the most, but not significantly different from compact car rental since those confidence bands overlap. However, they do prefer getting some sort of car rental to no car rental, and that sig difference is significant, and you can see that there. So just a little bit more information, uh, kind of looks a little bit schnazzier, but not necessary, depends on what your client is looking for. Now when it comes, those were all examples of what we would call categorical attributes. Uh, when it comes to numeric or ordinal, I like to show line charts instead. And the biggest reason I like to do this is in this example in particular is you can see elbows in the charts. Now the other examples were always sorted from most preferred to least preferred. When I have numeric attributes, I like to keep them in, the, you know, in order. So three nights to five nights to seven nights. And here we can see an example of the fact that there is an elbow in this line chart. So typically with price, things are linear. The graph decreases as the price increases. But here we can see that people are not preferring seven nights. Maybe they're thinking about a family vacation and that is just way too much time to spend together. And But three nights is too short, right? So five nights is kind of that optimal, optimal time frame. Now, one thing I brought up in the beginning was that price is conditional upon the number of nights. And so if you think about in the choice-based conjoint exercise, when I show three nights, I want to make sure that it's probably less than or equal to the price at five nights, which would be less than or equal to the price at seven nights, right? So we used conditional display or conditional pricing here. And then that's something you can uh, look into a little bit more through the website or through the software itself. Um, but when we talk about showing results of conditional pricing to our clients in this form of utilities, we have to remember that because we made price conditional, conditional upon the number of nights, the, even though we're getting individual utilities for the three different nights, we can no longer interpret the utility of the three different nights in our traditional way, which is an all else equal main effects mindset. So in other words, we have to interpret the utility of the number of nights part worth considering the average price that this number of night was shown. So the number of nights part worth are no longer disentangled from the price points. So the way we look at this is the utility for three nights at an average of $810 in this example is 1.8 versus the utility of five nights at an average of 1,150 uh, is 12.8 versus seven nights at an average of 1,500 is a negative 14.6 on a zero centered utility scale. So it becomes a little bit of a mouthful, uh, but luckily this process is really only challenging when we're showing graphs like this. Uh, if you move the part worth utilities into the market simulator, as I'll show you in a little bit, and just pay attention to the resulting shares of preference, everything is gonna work out properly with the model. It's just when you are presenting your report to the client and you have 
things conditional upon each other make sure they are no longer interpreted as this all else equals. Um, so a lot of a lot of comments there about that one, maybe a little bit from our, our more advanced users, um, but definitely something to consider. In the, in the uh, essence of continuing on this line chart example, when I come to price, maybe I also have some segments that I want to look at. Uh, and therefore, I'm going to show line charts by segment as well as by the total. Um, and so if you look closely at this graph, you can see that our segment one is probably the price sensitive segment, right? They seeming to prefer low prices uh, much more to high prices as their line is a bit steeper, the slope. And then versus segment three, whose slope is a bit more flat. So maybe they're not as concerned about price, but they're more focused on destination or accommodations. So pretty straightforward. Uh, when I get to this graph, what we call a thermometer chart, it's a way that we can show all the attributes together on a page. Um, and note each attribute here is zero centered. Now, sometimes, I prefer to put every attribute on a separate page uh, for the mere fact that you shouldn't compare a utility of one level within an attribute to a utility of another level within a different attribute, okay? We can compare those bands and the range between the attributes, but we can't compare the uh, utility value of the five-star hotel to the utility value of San Francisco. So we have to be a little careful when we show everything on one chart. That being said, there's infographics that people love and people don't want to look at a 17 page report anymore. They wanna look at just two or three. So if you can properly explain to your client how to interpret the results of conjoint analysis, then this is a very nice visual way to show that, hey, there's a very big gap between our destination location in San Francisco and Chicago versus maybe the number of nights people aren't so sensitive about, but there's a definite preference for five versus three versus seven. So these are our examples of what you can do with different utilities. And I'm sure people out there are much more savvy than Keith and myself might be in terms of graphing these things or coming up with uh, cool visual aspects. But uh, in all transparency, Keith and I are math nerds, so we don't do the visual thing. So if you ever have any examples for us, uh, feel free to share. I'm sure other uh, users and, of conjoint analysis and Saatchi software would like to see too. But this is what we provide and uh, what we're accustomed to. So from there, we move to importances. And importances are derived by taking the best level of an attribute minus the worst level of an attribute and repercentaging them to be out of 100%. So because we used individual level estimation, hierarchical Bayesian regression, we get also individual level uh, importance scores. So that is that first table there. And then those again are averaged and you can see the overall importances for each of the different attributes. Um, where Keith and I kind of hesitate with importances is that these don't tell the full story because they are directly affected by the range of levels that you choose for each attribute uh, and, and, and for the number of attributes and so on and so forth. Uh, an example would be maybe our list of destinations was, you know, San Francisco we saw did really well, um, Las Vegas is in there. Um, I'm from Michigan, so I'm allowed to say if I put Flint, Michigan on there, that might increase that range, right? And you might be even less likely to visit me in the Flint, Michigan area. And therefore, our range for destination has now become even larger. And so if I'm going to take the maximum utility within destination minus the minimum utility and get that range, I've now essentially exacerbated that important score for destination just because I had uh, what might be determined as a very bad level within my destination attribute. Um, same thing with price, right? If we throw 10 different price points in there that range the gamut of $100 a night to $10,000 a night, I've now probably arbitrarily made my price attribute most important because my important scores are directly affected by the range of levels. Uh, so just be sure to 
explain to your client and, and your internal team not to take importances as the end all be all. Uh, we really would prefer you move into the market simulator and play around there to try to figure out how changes in the different levels will affect preference. All that being said, if you wanted to show importances in your report, you could absolutely do that. Uh, typically, they are shown with this beautiful looking pie chart uh, ordered in preference. So destination becomes our most important here. Accommodation second, followed by price, number of nights, hotel type, and car rental. Uh, and I, we received a question the other day about always seeing price as the most important. And so in this example, you can see that that's not actually the case. And this is real data um, from Brian Orm's paper on perceptual choice experiments. Um, and price isn't the most important here. And again, that could be strictly because our of the destination levels that we chose, or it could be that our prices were pretty reasonable and so people were focusing more on destination and accommodation instead. Um, so it's not always the case that price or brand will be the most important, especially because of those reasons that I mentioned. If you are looking at your data by segment, a good way to show importances are by a vertical bar chart. Um, so using the same data as before, we can see that green bar in price for segment one really pop out, telling us that price is very important to this segment, hence they are probably the price sensitive segment, and for the remaining attributes, things seem to be pretty level set. Um, but a good way to look at importances by segment as well. Now that brings us to the crux of what Keith and I like to uh, create, which are our market simulators. Uh, oftentimes in my past life, when I worked at a market research firm, we would always put a simulator as a line item, giving the client the option to opt in or opt out, right? And you wanna win the bid. And so you price it so that they can pick and choose things a la carte so that maybe you have a more price competitive uh, proposal. But at the end of the day, I really don't think a simulator should be a line item. I think it should be an automatic deliverable if you want to get the most out of your conjoint exercises. And there's, you're spending a lot of money on getting those completes and putting together those designs. And the best way to use that information is through a simulator. Um, so the reason you should conduct these market simulations are that examining just the utilities and the importances only get you so far. I'm a big proponent of the statement that lies are in the averages. And those summary charts or bar charts or tornado charts that I've showed you really don't tell the whole story. If we look at this example here, uh, we have you know just a ge generic example. Let's say it's maybe uh, the color of a widget and there are blue, red, and yellow. If I just look at that bottom row, I would say, well, red has the highest average preference and therefore we should make our widget red. But if I look across the rows, respondent one actually prefers blue and respondent two actually prefers yellow and respondent three prefers blue. So I just made a recommendation based on averages that we should go with a red widget even though no one actually preferred the red widget. Um, so hopefully this is another kind of pat on the back to say, hey, utilities and importances are great ways to give you direction as to how to build your product or optimize your service, but they're not the end all be all. Simulators can actually help you answer questions like, at what price will people switch to our competitor? Or will a new product that I'm entering into the market cannibalize our own sales? Or how can we modify our current package and reduce costs, but still maintain employee satisfaction in the case of, a, of an HR example? Uh, so these are just some questions that simulators can help you answer. And the great part about conjoint analysis is that it's an additive model. So how much a respondent likes a product is simply the total of the utility values for the attribute levels that describe that product. Uh, therefore, we can create this market simulator that is essentially a choice laboratory for testing a multitude of real world possibilities. So you can see in the screenshot on the right, we have the different destinations, the different number of nights, the different star hotels, etc., and our share of preference on the right. We can change all of those product specifications in our simulator to see what would happen if. Um, so for example, maybe our client is building a hotel in Las Vegas 
and they want to figure out how to increase their share of preference. Well, I would be willing to put money on the fact that if I change the hotel type from business to resort, I'm probably going to increase my share of preference. Uh, same with price point, right? I imagine if I lowered the price if I could, I would probably increase share of preference and things like that. So you can start to see uh, where maybe the best destinations would be, where the you know optimal number of nights would be for a vacation package that you're going to put together, and hopefully you can start to see how this would apply to a project that you are actually working on. Um, but these choice simulators are voting machines for respondents. It's so cool to take their part with utilities and use them to assess, you know, which of the multiple different options that respondents are going to choose. And there are different ways that you can put together these simulators using different types of rules, uh, first choice or share of preference or randomized first choice. You can check out our market simulator webinar series to see a little bit more detail on those as well. Uh, we're not going to cover that, just the fact uh, that you can build these market simulators. But we do have to keep in mind that uh, we're making a lot of assumptions when we build these conjoint market simulators. Uh, we have to assume that we've interviewed the right people. An example there is if we only interview our current customers and we're trying to put a new product on the market, we're probably going to see a lot of cannibalization, right? But we have no idea if we're ever going to actually gain share from people that weren't our customers to begin with. Um, so we have to be careful what the goal is of the project and then set our interview specs to the appropriate piece. We're also assuming that each person is in the market to buy. Now, oftentimes in our choice-based conjoints, we allow for a none option, whether it's traditional or dual response. Uh, that kind of helps with the fact, but we're also presenting them a couple of options and an option to buy out, and we're almost encouraging them to choose, but we know that's not necessarily the case. So you'll need to make sure that you set up your screener appropriately, and you might need to do things like tune the exponent or um, the scale factor so that you can arbitrarily fix what the market actually looks like. And again, check out our market simulator series for more information there. Um, some other things that are, are being assumed, equal availability or distribution of the products, that respondents are actually aware of all the products, uh, that there's this long-range equilibrium, so equal time on the market, et cetera, et cetera. Some of these things can be handled uh, with our new choice simulator, but again, we were making assumptions and, and it's not uh, a foolproof, 100% accurate prediction of, air quotes, market share. That's why we use the term share of preference. Uh, but with the market simulator, we can also take our reporting results a step further and do what's called sensitivity analysis. So when you uh, have your choice simulator, you can start by specifying what we call a base case scenario. And typically this base case scenario has your client's product concept in competition with you know, a likely set of competitors. And you run the base case scenario within the choice simulator and you obtain that probability of choice for the sample and you write that down. And then you change the level of one of your attributes holding everything else constant and rerun the simulation. And you get that new likelihood of choice for that new product. Uh, and so what this is, is just the impact of changing one attribute to another level uh, and keeping everything else consistent. And the results can be plotted, as you see here, either as a line chart or a bar chart. So the plot on the left is showing what happens when everything else, so destination, accommodation, number of nights, etc., is held constant and our price is $650. Our share of preference is what looks like to be around 18%. But when I change that and increase the price, held everything else the same, the only thing I'm changing is the price point to 810, I drop about 10-ish percentage points uh, and I, my share of preference is now 7%. And then when I increase it again, I'm not gonna drop too much. It looks like a, to be about three percentage points in terms of my share of preference. Um, but there is a big dip in what happens to uh, people's share of preference when we move from 650 to 810. So maybe that's, that's not a good decision and maybe we want to um, look at doing something else or offering different types of uh, 
combination of the levels to increase people's likelihood to uh, prefer one of those higher price points. So that's the line chart on the left. The line chart on the right takes the base case and essentially makes it a 0%. And so our base case here in this case is $650 with all the other attributes held constant. The minute that I change it to 810, I lose 12%. The minute that I change it to 970, I lose a total of 16% or four percentage points. So it's basically plotting the differences that you see to the left and plotting them in a tornado chart uh, on the right. So we're showing deltas on the right and actuals on the left. It really depends on what you're going for in terms of your story, which one is preferred. Uh, I've seen it done and used both ways. I've also seen it done where you can put all of the attributes on and levels on one screen or on one chart, I should say. And now in this example, because we're talking about share of preference, we can absolutely compare across uh, of the entire graph. What we're doing is showing all the attributes at once in a line chart. And so our base case here is three nights, a four-star hotel resort with no car rental at the low price of $650 a person in the uh, destination of Las Vegas. So if you actually look across at all of those levels, you'll see that the share of preference is always 19% at this point. And so if I were to tr be trying to tell my client uh, what they could do to increase their share of preference, uh, I can see a big jump when I move from a four-star hotel to a five-star hotel, right? I can see about a seven percentage point change there. Same if I at least offer some sort of car rental. Uh, and then I'm going to tell them, hey, you've got to be very careful if you want to increase your price point because I see a big dip uh, in the people's share of pre in the share of preference for this product when I increase my price point. So instead of showing the utilities uh, at the individual level, I prefer to show what is what we refer to as sensitivity analysis in this type of approach. The hardest part about sensitivity analysis, though, is getting your client to agree to a base case. Um, so that's the conversation that I like to start up front, even when we're designing the conjoint, especially because if they have a base case in mind, you're going to want to make sure that you test those attributes and levels within the conjoint so you can compare it appropriately. Um, but once you get that base case nailed down, then it makes this analysis all that much easier. Finally, that brings us to optimization, which is also available um, in the SAW2 software package. And what this does is allows us to search for the optimal combination of a product or a portfolio of products based on either share of preference or revenue or even profitability. Um, and so what happens is that you define the search space and you can hold some attributes constant while others are searched or essentially optimized. And the output of this is typically a list of products that are going to garner you the most share. Uh, if my attributes and levels are a manageable number of combinations, then I typically like to use an exhaustive search method where I would see every possible combination of products and get the number one to the number 720 or something like that. But as you start to increase your number of attributes and your number of levels, you can imagine that the total number of possible combinations uh, can also exponentially increase. And even with the computing power of today, you might be taking days or even months to run an exhaustive search if you have uh, a very large attribute and level list. Um, so there are other methods to do that as well, uh, including a grid search or uh, some genetic algorithms. Right now you can use the SMRT product to do these optimization searches. And hopefully here in the summer, we will be releasing uh, the next version of Lighthouse Studio, which will have the exhaustive and grid search approach uh, in our choice simulator as well, instead of using the SMRT program. Uh, but for now, that is how we would do some optimization searches. And this is really powerful uh, when you're 
when your client is looking for the best product to put out on the market, uh, they only want you know one or two kind of options. They don't want to play around in the simulator. They want to know what to go forward with. That's typically when I'm looking for these optimization searches or in the example of looking for the winner of revenue and the winner of profitability, that's going to incorporate some additional data outside of the conjoint analysis uh, in, in terms of uh, how much it would take us to build the product versus how much market share we have and then figuring out what that profitability is. So it be can become even more powerful the more information that you have from your clients. And that covers uh, the optimization portion of the results. So I am going to make Keith the presenter and he is going to cover the extensions piece. Keith, was there anything that we needed to uh, answer about the beginning set or anything you wanted to add before you got started? Um, I was just going to mention, let's see here. Um, the, the, one, the one thing I thought worth mentioning is that although we, you know, we say bad things about the importances, um, I've, I've noticed that sometimes it can be really valuable uh, to, to, to compare the importances, the utilities, and the simulations to see if there are any apparent disconnects. Mathematically, there shouldn't be a disconnect, but sometimes it looks like there is. And this probably happens uh, three or four times a year for my clients. And I'm aware that people calling into our support line, see, you know, would add some, you know, 10 or 20 more of those uh, happening because I think this question, this sort of thing happens a lot and, and it confuses people when they see that uh, two utilities, for instance, might be um, very similar and, uh, and, and the shares might be similar, but the importances are really, for, for that attribute, um, are, are really large. So they, they might expect to see small importances because there aren't big importances in, or there aren't big differences in the utilities, but they see big importances instead. And if you think about it, that's happening because the importances are computed at the individual respondent level. So if we had a a segment, if we had a group of people, a population or a market full of people, and one of the attributes was color and the product could come in orange or blue, um, it could be that the average utility for orange and blue were quite similar. And if you built a simulation, the average share for an orange product would be very similar to uh, the average share or for the share for a, a blue product. But if, you, if, you're, if your importance is really big, it's telling you that you've, uh, that combination of information isn't contradicting itself. What it's telling you is that you've got a population of people who are composed partially of people who love blue and, and don't love orange very much, uh, and partially of a sample of people who uh, love orange and don't love blue so much. So you've got a lot of heterogeneity in your data. And so that can sometimes be an important part of the report that you need to communicate to your client. Uh, it's not that it doesn't matter whether your product is blue or orange because they both have about the same share, because there's so much heterogeneity, there's an opportunity to, to have both an orange and a blue product and appeal to different people. So uh, I just wanted to back off a little bit on, on the, the criticism that I, I think uh, we sometimes make about importance because uh, as analysts, we ought to be looking for apparent incongruities because oftentimes those hide really important parts of the story. Great point, Keith. Okay. So before, okay, now that we're not backing up anymore, um, we'll cover some extensions here. The first one I wanted to talk about is that typically we build simulators that do something like this, right? We, we can specify a scenario. We can specify the number of nights and the location and the price of our trip and so on. And it gives us a share of preference. Uh, another thing I've done a few times for clients is to make what I'd call a, a dynamic targeting simulator. So now, in addition, we've still got this stuff at the top. Um, which is the, the special, you know, which, which are, are, is the description of the uh, trip, you know, the, the three trip offerings and, and their shares. But in addition, uh, we're profiling the people who are choosing each one of those trips. So if we had trip one, two, three, four, blah, 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 all the way out to trip C, uh, we, could, we could characterize those people in terms of their demographics. Are they male or female? How old are they? What's their income? What's their household status? What's their employment situation? And we could and, and we could just we could search through the data and say, well, the people who we predict would choose trip one, 39% of them are female, which is which index is a bit lower than average. It, it, it appears to be the guys that want to go to Las Vegas, not so much the, the, the females. 
the, the, the folks who are picking that Las Vegas trip tend to be a little bit older than the, the folks picking the other trips because they're, uh, they've got a higher median age and uh, a lower household income, it looks like, and so on. So we could characterize uh, those people. We could almost treat the, the choice or the predicted choice people are making as a segmenting variable and profile people on the basis of it. And likewise, not just demographics, we could look at behaviors or psychographics and so on and see who these people are that are choosing each one of the options. So, so a targeting simulator, I guess, would be uh, an, an extension to this that we could talk about. Uh, another one that comes up all the time is, uh, is willingness to pay. It's the, uh, it's the value, of, it's measuring the, the dollar value of, of the features that are, that are in our studies. And historically, people did these sorts of things with simulated test markets, right? So you could, you could go to Basie's or someone like that, and you could have different cells of respondents uh, to make your forecast from, where each cell uh, you know, only differed in terms of the, the, a single feature and, and, and price. And then you could, uh, it's essentially a conjoint experiment where each respondent sees just a single uh, profile. And obviously, if you're, doing, you know, if, if you're doing 10 or 20 cells of these, and each cell you want to have two or 300 people, these, these get to be very large studies uh, very quickly. So they're not very popular for that reason, although I know people still do them. Um, contingent valuation is, is a methodology that was popular, uh, so, although I think it's... Uh, it's become less popular uh, lately. I think people, the, the economists are moving more toward using choice-based conjoint like the folks in marketing do. It's basically a direct questioning method. We give the respondents a very complete description of, of the good, the service, or the feature that we're going to be uh, showing them. And then we ask them how much they'd be willing to pay in order to get it. Um, so it's, a, it's pretty much a direct question. Hey, we're, we're offering you this great feature. It does this, this, and this. And uh, how much would you pay to get it? Okay. Uh, another way to do that, you know, another way to get this information is to get what's called willingness to pay, a, a willingness to pay measure from, from conjoint analysis. So, for example, if we had some sort of uh, quantitative attribute and a price variable and we measured them both as linear functions, we would just take the attributes coefficient divided by the price coefficient multiply by the by the price range and we'd have a, an estimate of willingness to pay. So for instance, just as a mathematical example here, if we had prices measured in the range of one to $200, our price coefficient was 5.2 and the coefficient for an attribute, say a warranty that ranged from three months to 12, but that was 2.2, uh, plugging those numbers into the equation, we'd say, oh, people's willingness to pay to get the longer warranty as opposed to the shorter one is $42. That's a pretty straightforward calculation. Um, the same thing applies if we have categorical variables instead of linear functions, except in this case, we might choose to use just the levels of the attribute for which we wanted to calculate willingness to pay. So if we had five different levels of warranty, uh, we might wanna calculate the, the willingness to pay from moving to the, from the fourth level to the fifth, or from the second to the third, or something like that. So, uh, we, we might want to restrict the range that we're doing, but the, uh, the math would be exactly the same as I showed on the previous page. Some caveats about willingness to pay. Well, for one thing, uh, there's a hypothetical bias. People spend survey dollars more liberally than they do real ones. And this, this applies to any kind of pricing research that we do. It's not specific to conjoint analysis because in any survey, it costs nothing to buy the product that people are asking you about. So if they're showing you a new product and telling you it costs $10 million, you can easily say, yes, I will buy it, even if you don't have $10 million in the bank. Because in, in surveys, for a lot of respondents, their wallets are always full and their credit cards are always empty. So they can, they can spend more liberally. So we have to worry about that hypothetical bias. And there are steps that we take to mitigate it, to make our surveys more interesting, to make our respondents feel uh, more interested in giving us realistic answers or, or more guilty when they don't. So uh, um, we've, we've got a whole section on that in a, in, a, in, a, in a training session we're giving this summer in Park City, but uh, 
we'll, we'll leave it at that for now. There, there is this hypothetical bias you have to worry about, but there are things you can do about it to mitigate it. Um, willingness to pay can also be affected by uh, competitive effects. Now, maybe I'm theoretically willing to spend $40 a month, but the truth is every brand uh, offers it for $10 a month. So uh, I'm never going to see that theoretically, that, that $40 that people are theoretically willing to pay uh, because of the competitive situation. So a lot of times we think of willing, the willingness to pay estimate we get out of research, whether it's the continued value, valuation uh, or a conjoint study, we tend to think about that willingness to pay as being the maximum possible price. Doesn't mean it'll ever be realized, it's just the maximum that, that could be out there under the right circumstances. Um, which is all the more reason to think about simulations because we need to take those competitive effects into account. Rather than just using a mathematical formula like on the previous page, we want to be more, more realistic. And then finally, there's a thing called attribute non-attendance. If, if When people take our conjoint surveys, they don't always pay attention to all of the attributes. And so if we're trying to estimate the willingness to pay for an attribute that a given respondent ignored, that respondent might have utilities that were close to zero. Uh, and you, if, if you look back at the math, or, or worse yet, they, they might not have been paying attention to price and the price utilities would be close to zero. If you do that, look at what happens to this equation here. If the price coefficient goes close to zero, your willingness to pay can get astronomically large. And that's, that's a potentially a problem. So uh, attribute non-attendance is another one of those things, kind of like the hypothetical bias. There's things we can do to mitigate it, to get people to pay attention. Um, you know, we might constrain our price utilities to be positive, for instance. Uh, certainly that would, that would solve the problem of, of reversals. Uh, in, in the econ world, a common solution is to force price to be a fixed utility function that's common across all the attributes. So uh, instead of running hierarchical bays, they would run a version of, 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 of a hierarchical model uh, or, or a mixed logit model where the price coefficient was constant for all respondents, and, uh, but the other attributes could, go, could have utilities that varied from one respondent to the next. And that's another way of potentially solving that problem. It's sort of a a brute force way of solving the problem, but it, it, it you know, it, it, it can work. Um, but I think having respondent level uh, utilities that we get from our hierarchical Bayesian analysis gives us some better options for handling some of the problems on the previous page. Uh, at, a, at a minimum, one of the things you can do if you're estimating willingness to pay is calculate that willingness to pay at the respondent level and then report the median willingness to pay because the, um, the, the median of, of, of pretty much any measure uh, avoids the extreme, uh, the extreme estimates from, from polluting the willingness to pay estimates. So if you've got some people who are giving you weird negative numbers for willingness to pay and some other people who are giving you arbitrarily large, almost infinitely large values for willingness to pay, uh, you can get rid of a lot of that noise by cutting off the ends of the distribution and looking at the median. Um, better still, and this is a, a suggestion that uh, we got in correspondence with John Hauser, uh, we, can calculate our, we can calculate utilities directly from simulations uh, rather than using the utilities uh, to, to, to do that calculation. And, and the way to do this is imagine that you're going to simulate two products A and B. They're identical except for being for two ways. Uh, one of the two ways is that product A has the feature you're interested in and product B does not. Uh, we're going to price product A at the current market price, and then what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to run repeated simulations, uh, and we're going to set product B as pr price. We're going we're going to test it and change it and and uh, and and uh, fiddle with it until the two products have an equal 50% share, and that difference the, the, then B's price um, that's going to tell us what the simulation-based willingness to pay is uh, for that uh, for that feature. So the, the, the yeah so the, the difference in the two prices the current market price and the uh, the, the share equalizing price that's going to be our simulation based willingness to pay estimate and I, I think that's probably uh, one of the better ways to get willingness to pay or at least I I, I feel comfortable when I when I've had problems with willingness to pay like it gives me outrageously large numbers this method has has uh, proven to do a better job for me at least. We can do needs-based segmentation. So, so we're talking about extensions, ways to get more value out of our utilities that we, we do our, you know, we, we do our conjoint study, we spend all this money getting these really great measures, you know, and, and we can, 
report the utilities, the importances, we can run simulations and calculate willingness to pays. We can also do needs-based segmentation. We, we, we basically use the conjoint utilities for segmentation. We can enter them directly into a cluster analysis, or we can run a latent class logit model to derive segments of respondents that have different utilities. Now, either way, what results are segments of respondents who have different patterns of preferences, and we, we fully expect that, that we'll see large behavioral differences once we plug those groups, uh, once we plug that grouping variable into our simulations, we'll see that those groups behave differently. And of course, we hope if they're behaving that differently in the simulations that they're doing so in the market as well. And then finally, I just wanted to mention that conjoint analysis oftentimes isn't the, uh, the end of a project. Sometimes it's just one small piece in a much larger project. So uh, the total value of a marketing pr program is, is a function of both the size of the market and the share of the market. And conjoint really does the best job of telling us about what, what share we might be able to get. Uh, but we also have to worry about how big the pie is, not just how the angle of the slice that we have, but the size of the pie. And for that, we might need um, a full market forecast. And so just the, the earliest one I, I, I worked on, and, and I can mention this one, I guess, because uh, everybody who commissioned it is retired now, so <laughs> nobody's going to complain. In the late 1980s, the, the market for uh, blood glucose monitors that patients could use in their home was exploding, and we had to take into account uh, both a share uh, both market share among patients and, of course, the number of patients, which was growing dramatically year on year. And uh, there were also different patient populations, different segments of patients that had different adoption trajectories because they had different uh, kinds of illnesses and different severities of illness. Conjoint obviously can handle the share piece, but the, uh, the number of patients depended on a lot of things. Uh, how, what the incidence was of new diagnoses what the conversion rate was uh, for different new and existing patient segments. Uh, we were in a market that unfortunately had fairly high patient mortality. So that's something we also had to take into account in our forecasting was that some of the people that we marketed to and converted and sold product to uh, died. Um, and then of course we had to take into account a variety of other disease and therapy and behavioral characteristics. For example, a lot of people don't think they're sick until they've been to the hospital for something twice. And for a lot of people, it's, it's they need two kicks in the head before they change their behavior, we found. And uh, anyway, we built that into the forecast. The resulting tool used a Monte, Car a Monte Carlo forecast to account for the, uh, the uncertainty in each one of the variables. And the conjoint simulator was just a small piece of that whole forecasting process. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Megan. Great. Thanks, Keith. Uh, so if you have any additional questions for us on reporting of conjoint analysis techniques, uh, feel free to type them in the chat now. What we did want to mention is uh, that you can join us next week in Huntington Beach for a three-day choice modeling workshop where we cover even more of the information that we talked about today and in much more depth. Um, you know, it's an easy little hop and jump over to the West Coast, and we'll be there on Monday, so maybe you'll join us. But if not, you can always join us in Park City uh, in July. We will be doing the same three-day choice modeling workshop, and Keith and Brian Orm, our president, will be presenting a new Becoming an Expert in Conjoint Analysis seminar, which is um, sure to be enjoyable. And we'll also cover menu-based choice in that workshop as well. Uh, so hopefully you can join us. If not, we appreciate you being part of our uh, webinar series. Just one uh, question that came in, it looks like, uh, is that there are standard errors associated with individual attribute levels. Uh, where can these be generated within Sawtooth or SMART? Uh, so the answer to that is when we run our typical hierarchical Bayesian analysis in Sawtooth Software Lighthouse Studio, on the summary tab, you can see the output of the confidence intervals. And when you run that analysis, you can uh, specify what you want that confidence interval to be. And so those are uh, general outputs within the Lighthouse Studio software on the summary tab for both Logit late and latent class and hierarchical bays. I'm not sure about the SMRT module, uh, if they're available in there. I do believe, though, when you do optimization searches, uh, there are standard errors around like a purchase likelihood score and things like that. Um, so feel free to read a little bit further in the manual on uh, where you can find that information. 
And Keith, how many, what proportion of projects you work on do you think you calculate willingness to pay? Well, that, that's that's a good question. Um, I, I would say that, that probably 60% of the projects that, that I work on, uh, the basic utilities, um, importances, and simulations reporting that, that Megan talked about uh, prob probably suffices 60 or 70% of the time. I, I, the willingness to pay, I, I don't think more than about 10% of my projects involve, uh, in, involve estimates of willingness to pay, but the, for the ones that do, it's really, really important to them to do it. So, um, but, but not that common. Perfect. I would probably say the same. Do you, is there a uh, theme in terms of the type of customer? Maybe like, I don't imagine willingness to pay being in CPG as much as like your higher ticket items, uh, maybe like automotive or pharma in terms of willingness to pay. Is there any sort of theme between the customers or clients for it? Uh, a lot of times uh, the, the customers that, that, that I can recall off the top of my head were either academics uh, who were do, who, who were doing it for academic economists who were doing it for for econometric modeling or they were um, most of them most of the rest were doing it for government agency type work so they, they were doing they were doing some research for government agency and trying to attach dollar values to things like social policies that don't really have dollar markets that they can compete in but they wanted to have some kind of metric to to compare the you know the value of the investments that would have to be made, um, and, and, and then and then a third smaller group uh, of those uh, of the folks who are asking for willingness to pay are people like like you mentioned who are dealing with higher ticket items, either technology items or durables. But but you're right in consumer packaged goods I, I don't really see it that often. Perfect, thank you. Uh, another question talking about uh, what standard functionality should be included in a simulator. Uh, so I'll answer just on personal preference uh, in terms of what I typically include in a simulator is I'm going to always ask my client uh, how many products they're going to need to simulate at a time because that's uh, something you want to build up front. So if you only build in three products and then they tell you six, there's quite a bit of rework to do there. Um, so I always make sure I figure out how many products they want to simulate at, at a time. And then I also ask them if there's any additional variables uh, that they want to look at in terms of, uh, as Keith mentioned, that target analysis piece. So do they want to see certain demographics or if this is a B2B sample, are there certain firmographics that they want to understand who's preferring each product? Uh, sometimes I'll put some nice graphs in there. So instead of just showing the share of preference numbers, I'll show it in a pie chart because our share of preference is going to be out of 100%. Uh, and then I, in terms of functionality itself, typically I make things that look like drop down boxes. Um, so you can click on the cell and then choose from the number of levels. And then I also um, write some macros to prohibit certain combinations in case I had prohibitions or things that just don't make sense. And if I have a price variable uh, that I interpret linearly, uh, then I will also allow them to type in the value instead of uh, choosing from a dropdown. So if I tested $400 to $800 and I, I uh, modeled it as a linear value, then I can have them type in 450 or eight, you know, eight, 712, whatever is within that range. Uh, Keith, anything else that you can think of in terms of functionality of the simulator? Uh, that pretty much covers it, but, but I always make sure to ask what, the, what my client wants. In fact, sometimes I'll even ask them to draft uh, a, a picture, even a hand-drawn picture of what they'd like to see, because the last thing I want to do <laughs> is give them information that might confuse their audience. I mean, some uh, some of my clients are very concerned about showing too much information, or oh, if we show that, you know, the the the, the VP of marketing is going to get really confused. We have to stay away from that. So, good point. Good point. Um, all right, let's see, we have time for just one more question. Uh, Keith, for you, do you find that your favorite method for calculating willingness to pay is fairly accurate or do you think it, it can be overstated? Uh, and do you have any verification such as tracking what actually happened in the market when you've done these willingness to pay studies? I've, I've, I've only had, a, a, only on a couple of occasions have I been privy to what happened later in the market. And uh, on, on, on one of them, 
let's see. One of them we didn't do willingness to pay. So that that although the forecast was was spot on, we never really changed prices. So that wasn't an element of it. For another one, it was it was very much a pricing study. Uh, and, and the client had commissioned the study specifically to find out about pricing because they were hearing from their advisors and their qualitative research that they should be pricing something at just at a small uh, a small premium to what was currently on the market. The conjoint study that we did showed that they could really price it at a very large premium. And the neat thing was we didn't even have to take competition into account very much because there really wasn't competition. It was really a new to the world product. And they ended up actually pricing it about double what they initially expected to price it. And it sold out for hotcakes. The, the, sold out like, you know, they, they sold like hotcakes. In fact, for about the next year, I had a lot of extra business from that client helping them uh, update their forecasts because they couldn't, they couldn't get enough products to keep the shelves full. So it was, it was a very, very much a success story there. Um, but I, I would say that I, I, I tend to suspect, however, that willingness to pay estimates, despite my best efforts, are, are oftentimes too high. And I, I, even if I can't, I can't always prove it, but, but I have that nagging suspicion just because I, I believe that people spend survey dollars too liberally, that, that, that more often they're too high than too low. Perfect. Thank you, Keith. All right, thank you everybody for joining us. We appreciate your time and please answer our follow-up feedback survey so that we can know which webinars you'd like to see next. Take care, everyone.